Hi, right, welcome. I'm here with Nico, Enrique, and Chance, which are three members of the development team that worked on spatialequity.nyc. Spatial Equity NYC documents inequities in the way that public space, including streets, sidewalks, and green spaces, is designed, distributed, and accessed. Uh, hi, Chris. Yeah, so this is this is really great. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm a research associate at the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism at MIT. Um, formerly, I'm trained as an architect, uh, environmental scientist, and planner, and a lot of the work that I do re revolves around uh, data visualization um, in regards to cities. And that's a lot of the work that we're looking at um, in, in the lab in particular is about how to make uh, data public, how to make it accessible, and how to make effectively better cities. Um, that's it for me. How about you, Enrique? Hi, yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm Enrique. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student at MIT, I'm studying computer science and engineering. Um, but mainly my my strong focus is on web development uh, and also some some data analysis and, and visualization as well. Um, so yeah. Uh, my name is Chance and I majored in computer science as well. And my overarching goal uh, as a developer as well as a, a researcher is to enhance the urban equity from the tech uh, perspective. So I use the multiple ways I'm interested in, like data visualization or some computer science computation way to try to learn how to enhance the equity issues yeah, in, in the urban spaces. Hi, I'm Jerry Pushasata. So I was on the team as a um, UX UI designer, and also um, I helped with uh, front-end development. So Spatial Equity NYC uses data to help you understand and shape your city. Uh, and in this project, we're really looking and asking the question, uh, how is public space shaped in New York City? Um, and how is the quality of public space in New York City vary across the entire city? Um, some neighborhoods, if we're looking at this photo, you can see there's like fresh new bike, uh, bike lanes where other places barely even have a sidewalk. And this disparity uh, really led a question of like, you know, there's tons and tons of data on this, but it's actually kind of hard to visualize it. And secondarily, it's also hard to act on it. Um, so our question was really looking at uh, questions about public space. So who gets trees? Who gets clean air? Who gets benches, parks to breathe, quiet, cool summers? These are some of the questions that we were looking at. And one of the very fascinating things about this project uh, is that all of this data was public. Uh, all of this data, or I should say semi-public, um, because really one of the biggest hurdles to getting all this data was just that there's so much of it. Um, so we didn't actually have to do much data processing uh, to do this. This is all about really making something, uh, turning data into something that's valuable and leverageable into to an actionable sort of agenda. Um, so here we have the New York City Open Data Portal, which is a really uh, like a fantastic database. But one of the issues is that there's just so many different data sets by so many different agencies, and they all have slightly different nomenclature, slightly different uses, um, and slightly different just uh, human interpretation of what some things might be. So for instance, if you're looking at the uh, New York City Open Data Health filter, right? We have open street locations, which we might find interesting. We have pool inspections, uh, popular baby names, and M. And these all these all fall under health. And maybe we understand that they might be, they might all be health filtered, but uh, their relationship between them is really, really unclear and they couldn't be more different. So uh, it becomes really difficult for someone to really, uh, you know, get into this and figure out what, you know, what exactly they want to get out of it. And similarly, it doesn't, there might be some visualization, but it doesn't aggregate it. So you have these anecdotes. Um, and there's some tools that already exist to process this information, but really, uh, we, we really wanted to develop like a one-stop shop for a lot of this information. Um, so some of the things that we were looking at was we wanted to have it at like a scale of political accountability, uh, which is probably like the, you know, some of the more interesting data analysis that we had to do. Um, demographic overlay, so not exact, not only like over space, who was affected by the different uh, influences of or the different uh, impacts of uh, quality public space, but also who. Um, it should be easy and quick of use, and we can talk about stakeholders in a second. And then it should also be solutions oriented. So how can we act on this data? How can we turn this into a meaningful solution? Uh, we'll start by clicking citywide data. We can go to health, for instance, and right away we can start to see that there's a number of interrelated metrics um, that we've sort of done the research on and realized that 
traffic injuries, air pollution, fatalities, noise, asthma, these are all metrics um, towards health that have some sort of uh, inter some relationship between them all. And uh, they all kind of can build a picture about what the health of the neighborhood might look like. And while we don't necessarily provide an index score of health or like an overall grade, um, we, we allow people to kind of start to build an understanding that there's relationships between them. So let's look at traffic injuries to start. And uh, right off the bat, by clicking traffic injuries, like as a default, it starts with a histogram. And uh, this histogram, let me just move the, uh, here, I'm going to move your icon over here. I'll even minimize it for now. Uh, this histogram, when you're hovering over it, allows you to see effectively every single council district and how it ranks. And one of the most important things you can see with this is you can just start to read how the fall off of the neighborhoods, uh, you know, this, this is like almost borderline starting to look exponential, but you can start to see that, um, uh, you can start to get an understanding of how people are, uh, how different neighborhoods have these, uh, uh vary in terms of traffic injuries and we can click, right. We can click different, uh, different components to pin them. We can also see different boroughs. So we can see in this case, um, you know, a lot of the neighborhoods in Brooklyn, uh, some in Queens, some in Manhattan, and a couple in the Bronx are kind of like near the near the top in terms of traffic injuries. Um, let's start to look at this from a spatial perspective, though. So now that we're here, we can start to like this. The map is just such a good way to see how like it, it is showing what equity, how spatial equity and the quality of public space varies across the city. Right. And we can start to see traffic injuries. Uh, really start to concentrate in a couple of areas. And maybe one of the novel things uh, to our site that I think is, you know, kind of exciting is, first of all, we're able to highlight uh, the areas that really have, um, like, the highest, you know, for instance, the top five highest rates of traffic injuries, right? So we can zoom in. And uh, what's interesting is, okay, so we, we now have a sense that Council District 8, um, you know, it ranks fifth of the 51. So we can Let's let's zoom in even further and see what's going on here. And one thing you might notice um, is as we zoomed in, there's actually a new scale of data that appears, and you can see that even the um, even the legend changes. And what this is is this is like the the data is actually being reported um, at two different scales depending on how zoomed in you are. So we're now reporting the data at the neighborhood tabulation uh, at the neighborhood uh, at the neighborhood scale essentially. Um, the ter the technical term is the neighborhood tabulation area, but what this is offering us is you might be looking at uh, Council District 8 and you can see like, okay, so East Harlem South actually isn't really like the major concentration of traffic injuries. It's uh, Mott Haven, Port Morris and East Harlem North. And if we turn it on, we can even see that um, if we turn on the uh, Council Districts with the most traffic injuries at this scale, so again, if we zoom out, you can see that it might be this area. But once we zoom in here, you can really see the concentration of traffic injuries, um, the highest concentration of traffic injuries at this scale is actually Hunts Point. So we understand that at the, the citywide scale, it's kind of concentrated within uh, within here, but as soon as you zoom in, it'll remap that information. You can really see like this might be the highest concentration of traffic injuries, but this entire area uh, is really like further north than just what we were getting at, at this uh, citywide perspective. So what that really means is that someone from uh, a staff member from this area can not only advocate for, you know, at the city scale, hey, listen, we have a higher rate of traffic injuries uh, with 308.3 injuries per 10,000 residents, which is like super citable. Uh, but we can also zoom in and say, okay, well, if we have the funding, we now know that we need to allocate funds to Mott Haven, Port Harris, East Harlem North, and, and uh, even if you're in Council District 17, it would be Hunts Point. Um, we're starting to get like two different two different scales that help facilitate two phases of decision making, getting funding or getting you know starting uh, getting motivated to address a concern, and then secondly how to address this concern. Um, so with that, I'll also show, and I'm going to jump back to the map in a second, but we can also start to think about what exactly they might want to do. Uh, say they get funding. Uh, what are the solutions? And like that's again, we were really oriented towards solutions being in integrated into the site. And so we have this entire column that would be good for a policy decision maker, someone with an, uh, with capital, to basically um, uh, to to be the sort of first step in towards determining what's the best solution for their area. So install speed reduction infrastructure, 
build local traffic only open streets, convert car lanes to bus lanes and bike and bike lanes, right? So uh, suddenly we have, a, and we have a ton of different sources that people can go to, to read up more on, to see what might be the best for their, for their neighborhood. So it's not, I mean, it sounds like when you say one-stop shop, you mean that, that you're not, you're, you're giving people the data they need to make, uh, make useful arguments. And like you said, very citable data points, uh, but you're also giving them uh, a starting point for their, uh, their advocacy and research of what, what can be done about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, I mean, to us, that's super important, right? I mean, everything that we're hoping to do is to make data more actionable and it's to make data more, uh, yeah, to data for good, right? <laughs> so so really, like this is, our, our ambition is this site can be like a launching point for someone to then begin their own research um, to then, you know, corral a different, a number of different initiatives. And like, that's probably where, you know, without jumping too far ahead, like that's probably where some of the next steps will be for us is to help further initiate certain things like that, how to, how to get the ball rolling faster and further. Excellent. Um, sorry, we're at about 30 minutes right now. Um, so you're, you were going to, are you going to give another demo kind of using the different, uh, the different persona? Yeah. 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 So again, I'll just uh, quickly wrap up with some of the map stuff um, and then the persona. So just really quickly and uh, yeah, like there's tons we can go through here, but we can certainly compare different types of demographics about people um, at the same time. So you know, we can look at vehicle ownership, we can look at poverty level, you know, and you can start to see by just having this sort of synchronized map, um, how exactly like these two different things, uh, these two different uh, metrics and demographics overlay, we can see that poverty level and traffic incidents um, seem to have some sort of uh, uh, pattern that we can overlay. And again, you can, you know, adjust this uh, and see this, you can take a screenshot, include it. Um, so that's, that's some cool functionality and that's some great functionality for the citywide data. I think the community profiles, which is, you know, one of the, one of the best parts that Mapbox has really helped us with um, was sort of to geolocate when we're, when we type in an address, right? So if we want to type in, for instance, um, Storia, right? Uh, we, but we both have sort of these prefetched solutions like district 22, district 26, but we also uh, put in the Mapbox API uh, using the Mapbox API, we were able to basically fetch a number of addresses and so forth. So you can type in your own personal address. Um, and that's when we're starting to get towards like a community member or someone that lives in a neighborhood, right? Because they might not know that they're in District 22, right? Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't, but you can totally type in your address and it'll, and it'll uh, figure out that address. It'll do a Boolean operation to determine where that is, um, what, what district that's in, and then it'll fetch the results and compile everything for us there. So again, now that we have, uh, now that we're looking at the community profiles, again, we can start to click through different areas. We have these tool tips um, that again, have this very specific language and information, but we can also go um, to the, the, uh, the chart page and we can start to see how this neighborhood fares in terms of every single metric within the city. And the first three are, uh, you know, their most, concern, uh, most pressing issues. And we can also look at it in terms of a, like a table view and we can see where it, where it lands. So it's, you know, top 10, let's say, in terms of uh, uh, park access, uh, like bottom, bottom 10 in terms of park access. Um, and then we can just expand other metrics too to take a look at that. And we can use these histograms to really intuitively see how, how they're doing there. So I think, I think this is a good place to, you know, this, this kind of gives a good sense of what some of the functionality is how the spatial tools are, are playing out there. So maybe I'll leave it at that for now, but uh, you know, there's always a lot more we can talk about, yep. but since this is about, we, we should definitely talk about the development side of things as well. So I'll probably leave it at there for now. So you built this for a nonprofit called Transportation Alternatives. Um, how did that connection happen? How did they get in touch with the, the Civic Data Design Lab at MIT? Uh, did they do an RFP or did they, you know, did they already have a relationship with you guys? How did that happen? Yeah, so we, you know, um, Again, the director, the director of the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism, Sarah Williams, she's done a lot of work in New York. Um, she's been engaged with different advocacy groups uh, for a number of years. So um, in through communication, like there had been a couple of times where T Transportation Alternatives or TA had been wanting to do something like this. And it was just kind of looking for the right moment and the right question of framing. So even though the, pro the project maybe took, um, you know, five, five months of development, uh, it was really a couple of years of thinking through, you know, developing a, a framework and a research question 
And that was largely through conversations with the you know, uh, director of research at Transportation Alternatives, whose name is Philip um, Matiowski and uh, Sarah Williams, the, the director. So they had been in an open conversation and finally the stars sort of aligned to, to make this happen, so. And so with Spatial Equity NYC, uh, you, just, you just showed us you know, how powerful the maps are, but can you just tell us a bit more about why maps are a good way to present uh, rich data like this? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Enrique, Chance, feel free to jump in at any point, but um, to, to start, I mean, maps are such a valuable language tool. Um, they're so, I think, I think the sort of legibility of a map is only increasing as people have, you know, uh, uh, map, Google Maps in their pockets or, you know, uh, these, this familiarity and legibility of mapping has become super intuitive to uh, like a really a wide array of people. And it's great to be able to see, you know, in such an intuitive way, you can just layer on a coral cleft map um, and understand there's visible differences, right? And I think um, that ability to overlay statistics in such a familiar way really helps overcome a lot of the sort of challenges of data visualization where there's typically a barrier uh, or a bar to being able to process or understand or, or just get through to, to a, even a layperson what exactly you're trying to communicate. But I think that to each person, you can, whether or not you, uh, everyone might take away something different from it or what, what's important to them could totally vary from metric to metric, but everybody can see by looking at this map that there's disparities across New York City. And I think, I think out of all things, the map is the most intuitive way to do, to do that, right? What were some of the challenges presenting data that is this rich and complex via maps? You've got multiple data sets, you've got side-by-side -side maps so for comparison, you've got overlays. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of challenges arose that you had to overcome with uh, you know, design decisions and user experience decisions? I see. Uh, so basically, as you mentioned, we, have, we are trying to present in multiple data sources and very complex map visualization. So I think one of the challenges to how to create a good entry point for a user and how to establish the link between the user and the, and the data. So for this challenge, we used the Mapbox geocoding API to establish the relevance between the user and the complex data information. So when they are trying to explore some data issues, the equity issues, they can just, just simply type in the location they care about, maybe their home address or where they are working, and then get the responses to see what's the equity issue in their neighborhood. So that's one thing I'm very, uh, I think it's very important in the process. Yeah, and I guess just to add on to that, like as, as Nico was mentioning, there was just a lot of data uh, and, and a lot of different layers that that resulted from that. So I think having to work with all of those layers and, and, and especially because the map itself is extremely interactive. Um, usually when you go to, to, to websites and see a map, there's not that much interactivity. Like here we see many different layers getting changed at a time. You can see kind of the map disappearing and then coming back and, and when, when you toggle it on and off, you see the, the, the zoom toggle that was occurring where the, the different layers change when you're, when you're zoomed in. So having all that interactivity definitely was um, uh, a, a big challenge uh, in this project and presenting the data. Um, so what what are some of the things that you learned in the process of building spatial equity? So so maybe just following on my previous answers, uh, I just thought how to how to build a connection between the user and the data. And another thing I learned in this developing process is how to build the connection between different data sources, different data sets. Uh, like, uh, for example, as uh, Nico just the demo, we have a histogram that we can pin some specific borrows in the histogram. And when we switch between different urban issues, the data issues, we can uh, keep the same set of the pinned borrows to focus on these borrows. What's the data issues? What's the equity issue in the specific uh, urban regions? So such designs are enabling our users to focus on the uh, connections between different data sets. So the thing I learned in this point, it's how it's, it's a, it is very important in the designing process 
when we have a lot of rich and complex spatial data sets and find a way to design an interface for users to explore the connection between them. Uh, so you, you've already shown us map rendering and you've shown us the geocoding API, which you mentioned. Uh, can you tell us more about the overall spatial stack that went into building spatial equity at NYC? I can just, I can just give this like whole spatial stack, like a run, a rundown. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the most fundamental thing to, to a lot of what we were doing, like the sort of foundation for it all was using the Mapbox API. So we're using both the base map. So we did, you know, we did a lot of the styling, uh, in Mapbox studio. Um, and then we imported that using our API key and our style. Uh, and then in addition to that, the other side of the, like the amazing Mapbox solution was the, uh, geolocation feature. So that was kind of like the, the base to a lot of the behind the scenes functionality. And then on top of that, we used uh, deck GL. Um, and again, deck GL is just, just, uh, out of the box solutions for tooltips and like updating layers through react was really, really useful. Uh, some of the solutions that we had to employ to kind of connect Mapbox and uh, DeckGL was using TerpJS. So, you know, when we would search for a location, uh, Astoria Heights or MoMA, New York City, you know, whatever it is, uh, we would get returned uh, coordinates and that those coordinates would be then, we'd then project a point onto the map and we would use TerpJS to um, uh, basically do like a Boolean test to see if that point falls within a particular polygon. If it fell into a polygon, then we would update the state for a number of different layers uh, and basically trigger a sequence of events that would like uh, enable uh, the community, the community profiles. Um, and that was, yeah, you know, that, that was something that I was trying to figure out for a little while. I had a number of solutions where I was trying to emulate a click by projecting a point to screen space, then like clicking. But as soon as there was something, a click that was happening off screen, it became a bit of a hassle. And uh, I think Enrique actually deployed something similar for uh, like some custom components that we did at some point where if you would, you would, uh, be before we had Nebula, we had like a fixed tooltip that was actually just a div that was being translated every render, which was like a really like uh, duct tape solution to a complex problem. But then we found that we can just, uh, there was some out of the box solutions again, that would just georeference a custom component, uh, which was through Nebula, which was pretty useful. Um, so yeah, there was there was turf, and then um, the last one, sort of a late addition to kind of smooth out a couple of things that were a little rocky was the was Nebula, which is something that I think is is new to all of us. We haven't looked too much into what other features it has, but it it is really feature rich in terms of like doing geospatial analysis and and masking and clipping and things like that. So, so now all of your all of your spatial developers. So are there any special special spatial developer tips? tricks and tools that you use while building this app. So any, any workflow stuff that comes up that is unique to spatial development or I'm already seeing smiles, so I can't wait to hear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, guys, do you want to go ahead? I mean, my, my, my knee jerk reaction was going to say, um, yeah, I mean, like I've joined every forum possible for you know, like, like the most important toolkit I think is, uh, is posting your problems on forums. <laughs> Even even so, posting your problem on forums, then going on an alternate account and posting the wrong answer. That's how you really solicit someone to give you the right answer is someone's like, no, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. You know, <laughs> no one will answer you unless you give them unless they have to prove somebody else wrong. Right. No, I love it. I love it. I haven't heard that strategy before. And I love, I love the like, yeah, you're priming the pump. And uh, yeah, it reminds me of the, the you know, the, there's an I think there's an XKCD comic where, you know, uh, couples, you know, one person says, come to bed, honey. And the other one's like, no, I can't. Someone on the internet is wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. What else? Give, give me some more, give me some more spatial developer tricks. Yeah. I mean, it, it just goes without saying, read, reading the documentation, um, like looking, searching on, on, I don't know, on, on Google. Um, sometimes we ran into these issues that uh, actually hadn't been fixed yet. There were some bugs that we kind of ran into, we found on GitHub uh, that, that some issues had been created there. So we kind of were, we're in, we're in contact with them. Um, and, and also with just modularity in general, um, I remember coming into the project and opening up a 2000, you know, lines of code in, in, in a single uh, a JavaScript file uh, was a bit overwhelming. So kind of breaking <laughs> things up uh, uh, and, and putting things into different components and, and adding that modularity. Um, I think that's, that's really important. Um, it can be helpful to go through and understand all, all everything. Um, yeah. Excellent. Is the source code available? 
so yeah, we have it on we have it on uh, GitHub. It's it's open there. Um, we're like currently working on just documenting everything, like adding the markdown. Uh, you know, we're basically the past few weeks have been about just um, you know profiling the site and making it a bit more efficient. Uh, and just we expect to do more work on it. So we're adding a bunch of annotations and uh, and way, simplifying things just such that when we return to it, it's super clear. You know, I'll, I'll just I'll just finish off saying that the the Center uh, for Advanced Urbanism at MIT, the Civic Data Design Lab, um, these are the labs that uh, we we're all part of, and we're really interested in questions about uh, urban equity. We're really interested in questions about how data can make cities better, how data can make cities more accessible, um, and how can it how can it effectively make things that are invisible visible, right? So. Uh, we're always open to collaboration, to new ideas. Um, so I encourage you all to to reach out to me. I mean, you, I think there's you could probably add my email, um, and we can have a conversation because I think that you know there's just so much work to be done here, uh, and there's so many different possibilities. And we're we're already starting to work with other cities as well, uh, and other advocacy groups, and other organizations, and other cities. So like we're open in all ears. Just uh, feel free to have a conversation, and we can see what might be able to come from it. I feel like there's a ton of different fruitful relationships to come in the future. So, so Chris, thank you so much. Uh, Chance, you know, as usual, Jari, like you guys did such a fantastic job. Um, and so I'm really happy that we're kind of getting the opportunity to celebrate this all. And, and you know, Mapbox is amazing. Like, we're <laughs> so, so like, it's great to be able to, to have an open channel with you guys. Um, yeah, thank you.